Let's take a trip, a 20-year trip down memory lane. Let's go back to the sunny hibiscus coast of um, north of Auckland, near the Whangaparaua Peninsula. Let's go back to Ōrewa, to the Ōrewa Rotary Club, that hotbed of revolution. The year is 2004, and Don Brash, the newly minted leader, or relatively newly minted leader of the National Party, gives a speech, a State of the Nation speech, just a few days before Waitangi Day. And Don Brash decides to address some things that have been, well, bubbling along under the surface of New Zealand and National Party policy for a while. Um, and a little bit like every National Party before or since, he's in a hostile environment with a hostile, increasingly woke news media. So Don gives a speech. Some accuse Michael Bassett former Labour Party members of writing the speech, a claim which has been denied by Michael Bassett. But in the speech, uh, Brash will cover many aspects of Māori Pākehā relations, criticises um, people, policies he believed were separatist, and floats the amazing idea that there should be one rule of law for all New Zealanders. Pretty radical, huh? I thought, given the debate that the media are trying to say is happening now, given what they say is going to be a revolution and the outlandish claims of the Maori Party and experts in Maori dim and woke Pākehā and white people, I thought it would be good to listen to that speech again. So for the next hour or so, we're going to play it uh, in full. Um, so let's go, let's go now, cross now, to the Odua Rating Club. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. I appreciate that very generous introduction. President Neville, Your Worship the Mayor, my parliamentary co colleague, Dr. Lockwood Smith, former leader of the National Party, Jim McClave. I should perhaps also acknowledge the ghost of an even earlier leader of the National Party, Rob Muldoon. I suspect may well be lurking here somewhere. <laughs> Distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, this is the second occasion on which I've addressed this club on the last Tuesday of January and I very much appreciate your invitation. Soon after becoming leader of the National Party, I outlined my five main priorities. First, as a country, we must take vigorous steps to counter the long-standing relative decline in New Zealand incomes, which sees our per capita incomes now around $180 per week, or about $9,000 per year, lower than those enjoyed by Australians. The Labour government is doing nothing to bridge this gap, but is instead erecting barriers to faster growth at almost every turn. Second, we must deal with the fact that too many of our children leave school massively handicapped by illiteracy and innumeracy. Today's education system is failing many of our children particularly the least privileged. If education is the passport to a better future, too many of our children currently have no chance of getting there. The Labour government is failing to deal with this issue and has made things worse by removing the elements of parental choice which the national government introduced during the 90s. Third, we have to face the reality that traditional Kiwi values are being destroyed by a government-funded culture of welfare dependency. National will stop communities wasting away on welfare. Sitting at home on welfare should never be an option, as the Labour government seems to believe. Fourth, we must deal with the issues of security 
and especially the current half-hearted attitude towards enforcing the law in New Zealand. Under a national government, when people step over the line which marks the boundary between honest and criminal activity, between civilised behaviour and that which preys on the community, they'll be punished. Labour, by contrast, appears to be much more concerned with the rights of the criminal than with those of the victim. And fifth, the topic I will focus on tonight is the dangerous drift towards racial separatism in New Zealand and the development of the now entrenched treaty grievance industry. We are one country with many peoples, not simply a society of Pākehā and Māori where the minority has a birthright to the upper hand as the Labour government seems to believe. Over the next few months, I plan to give a major speech on each of my five main priorities. But tonight, I want to speak about the threat which the treaty process poses to the future of our country. I'm focusing on this topic because just before Christmas, after Parliament had risen for the year, the government announced its foreshore and seabed policy, a policy with potentially huge significance for the future of our country. So let me begin by asking, what sort of nation do we want to build? Is it to be a modern democratic society embodying the essential notion of one rule for all in a single nation state? Or is it the racially divided nation with two sets of laws and two standards of citizenship that the present Labour government is moving us steadily towards. The spirit of the Treaty of Waitangi was expressed simply by Governor Hobson in February 1840. In his halting Māori, he said to each chief as he signed, He iwi tahi toto, we are one people. A number of issues flow from this. They are complex, highly sensitive, even emotionally charged. But I believe in plain speaking, so let me be blunt. Over the last 20 years, the treaty has been wrenched out of its 1840s context and become the plaything of those who would divide New Zealand from one another, not unite us. In parallel with the treaty process, and the associated grievance industry, there has been a divisive trend to embody racial distinctions into large parts of our legislation, extending recently to local body politics. In both education and healthcare, government funding is now influenced not just by need, as it should be, but also by the race of the recipient. The Nelson Tasman Primary Health Organisation is a good example. <coughs> PHOs are explicitly established on a racial basis. And the Nelson Tasman PHO is required to have half of the community representatives on its board representing local iwi, even though the number of people actually belonging to those local iwi is a tiny fraction of the population covered by that PHO. Much of the non-Maori tolerance for the treaty settlement process, where people who weren't around in the 19th century pay compensation to the part descendants of those who were, is based on a perception of relative Maori poverty. But in fact, Maori income distribution is not very different from Pākehā income distribution, as sociologist Simon Chappell pointed out a couple of years ago. Maoriness explains very little about how well one does in life. Ethnicity does not determine one's destiny. It is the bottom 25% of Maori 
most of them on welfare, who are conspicuously poor. They are no different to Pacific Islanders or other non-Maori on welfare. It's just that there is a higher percentage of them. In Let me now counter some of the myths of our past. Too many of us look back through utopian glasses, imagining the Polynesian past as a gent genteel world of wise ecologists, mystical sages, gifted artists, heroic navigators, and pacifists who wouldn't hurt a fly, in the words of Roger Sandel in his book. It was nothing like that. Life was hard, brutal, and short. James Billich shows us that once guns fell into Maori hands in the early years of the 19th century, ancient tribal rivalries saw Maori kill more of their own than the number of all New Zealanders killed in World War I. Probably 20,000 Maori were killed by Maori in the 1820s and 1830s. Equally, however, the initial Maori contact with the Europeans was hardly a contact with the cream of European civilization. The first Europeans that Maori encountered were explorers, whalers, escaped convicts from Australia, and then settlers, hungry for land to build a new life. Many were none too concerned about the niceties of the treaty. Any dispassionate look at our history shows that self-interest and greed featured large on both sides. Pākehā tried hard to separate Māori from their lands and usually succeeded. Yet in spite of these problems, and in spite of all the turmoil, the shocks from the collision of two cultures and the chaos of unprecedented social change, the evidence clearly shows that Maori society was immensely adaptable and very open to new ways. That adaptability and resourcefulness, that openness to opportunity, that entrepreneurial spirit is something that survived the trauma of colonization and is today reflected in a Maori renaissance across a wide range of business, cultural and sporting activity. We should celebrate the fact that despite a war between the races in the 60s, 1860s that is, and the speed with which Maori were separated from much of their land, partly through settler greed, partly through a couple of generations of deficient leadership by some Maori, our treaty is probably the only example in the world of any such treaty surviving rifle shots. Those who said a hundred years later that New Zealand possessed good race relations by world standards were not wrong. While we try to fix the wrongs of the past, we should celebrate the good things and shared experiences that underpin our nationhood. All Maori got the right to vote and had it long before 1900. By the 1930s, they possessed equal rights of access to state assistance, be it pensions or subsidized housing loans or access to education. One standard of citizenship was gradually working and the gaps that existed in every other colonial country were closing here as Maori took advantage of full employment. Although he listed a number of land grievances in his centennial speech at Waitangi on the 6th of February 1940, Sir Rapa told those present that in the whole world it was unlikely that any native race had been as well treated by settlers as Maori. Let me be quite clear. Many things happened to the Maori people that should not have happened. There were injustices and the treaty process is an attempt to acknowledge that and to make a gesture at recompense. But it is only that it can be no more 
than that. None of us was around at the time of the New Zealand wars. None of us had anything to do with the confiscations. There is a limit to how much any generation can apologize for the sins of its great grandparents. There are a few radicals who claim that sovereignty never properly passed from Maori into the hands of the Crown, and thus ultimately into the hands of all New Zealanders, both Maori and non-Maori. They are living in a fantasy world. These claims come from the more radical Maori end of the spectrum. They can be seen for what they really are, a negotiating position. What worries me about the current treaty debate is that we find ourselves now at the beginning of the 21st century still locked into 19th century arguments. Too many Maori leaders are looking backwards rather than towards the future. Too many have been encouraged by successive governments to adopt grievance mode. I want now to briefly review the more recent history of the treaty process. We've moved from a badly drafted and ambiguous treaty document of 1840 in the long period of colonization to an attempt to live by the simple principles that seem to underlie that document.